Welcome back, everybody. We are now less than a week away from the start of the 2022 MLB season. And to get you guys ready for the start of the season, I've brought Matt and Will back on stream today. We've been working hard for the past few weeks to get our baseball simulations and model ready for the start of the season. On today's stream, we're going to be talking about what is a baseball simulation, why the data that you get out of these sims is crucial to be successful playing MLB DFS in 22, and do a deep dive into the individual factors that go into our sims to show you how it all really works. So uh, again, today we've got a lot to get through, so we'll jump right in in just a moment. But before we get started, I will just mention one more time here that these shows are live for a reason. Please ask questions for us. If you have questions, you can pop them into the YouTube chat or the Office Hours channel in Slack, and we'll wrap around to some questions at the end. Uh, but let's go ahead and just dive right in. And I'm going to start here by asking you guys, what is a simulation? How is this different than the other ways of creating baseball projections? Yeah, I can take that one. So a simulation uh, basically means that rather than uh, kind of like running a statistical model where all we're trying to do is predict the average uh, fantasy point output, a mm -hmm. simulation means that we're actually running these um, play, all of the games play by play. Um, and essentially it's like, you know, playing a video game, mm -hmm. um, but just like automated. And we just do that thousands of times. So, you know, we'll take the uh, starting lineups for the teams. We'll take, you know, the park and all these different factors and we'll start the game. You know, it starts zero, zero, the top of the order is up and we'll just go play by play. And we have all these inputs based on the uh, different rates for all the batters and pitchers. And we do that and we finish the game and store all of the results. And then we, do it again and we repeat thousands of times. So what we end up with is um, this full range of outcomes for every game where it's not just the average projections, it's literally, these are all thousands of different possible outcomes that could happen based on uh, not just sort of each player's like average results, but their full, like um, their variance, their standard deviation, all of these different factors that kind of combine together in this play by play simulation that ends in you know these thousands of different uh thousands of different data points for each player and for each game gotcha okay so when when somebody uh sees our projections they they go into the app for the first time and they see the, the projections kind of similar to what you you may see elsewhere around the industry uh, what is the the difference between that average projection that they're seeing on saber sim versus you know if they've seen it somewhere else on some other site what's what's the difference going on there yes yeah, so that number you know is it's sort of the meaning behind the number is the same as on Saber Sim and another site where it's, we're saying, you know, this is the average projected result. The difference is on Saber Sim, literally we, we take all those thousands of, of outcomes in the Sims and then we just take the average of them to create that projection number. But that's just kind of one number that's summarizing all of this data that we have at our disposal. And so, there's a lot of different ways that you can take those thousands of data points and have more information on them. And so when you you know go on SaberSim and you you see that projection number, that's the average, but then you can see the 25th percentile and the 50th percentile and the 95th percentile. And those are sort of different, um, you know, the percentiles are sort of like different points on this distribution where the 95th is, you know, that's what the player is going to hit 5% of the time, you know, that, that top 5% of their um possible outcomes mm -hmm. and so uh you know even though the that projection number sort of means the same thing on saber sim as it does other places how we're getting there is a lot different and then what you can do with that data is also a lot different and so um you know so you're, you're kind of doing yourself a disservice on saber sim if you're just looking at that one number because yeah. it's it's uh just like a a summary of this full simulator and all of these different data points Gotcha. Cool. Yeah. So, I mean, as, as we go along here, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the amount of work that that's kind of going into, to produce these and all the factors that you're taking into account. But I mean, what I'm hearing right off the bat is that, you know, we're by essentially trying to capture the entire range of outcomes, uh, for, for a particular player or for a particular game, would you say that's like a more challenging way to, to go about doing this? I mean, it seems to me that, that it feels like there's risk at least present there, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I think anybody, you can, you can take an uh, intro to statistics mm -hmm. course, an intro to our course, and you can probably create um, some average 
uh, MLB projections by you, you know, you input everyone's uh, season statistics and maybe you input like the park and you do a, a linear regression and you can come up with something that sort of maybe looks reasonable mm -hmm. um, for an average projection for each player. Um, doing a simulation is very difficult yeah. uh, because you have all of these factors that all have these different rates. So not just eat the batter and the pitcher, but you have the park, you have the weather is kind of a tough one to account for. You have the umpire, uh, you have all these factors. And then throughout the game, you know, you're simulating and you have to adjust the race based on the state of the game as well. So someone gets a double. If someone's on second, that actually kind of affects the rates for the probabilities of these different events, because it's going to be a higher probability of an intentional walk, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and and so and then you have to account for you know pitching changes and stolen bases and yeah. all of these different things that go into the actual way that a game plays out. Um, and so there is you're right there is risk there because if you don't mm -hmm. do it well, then you can end up with some pretty biased projections where you know say you're like not accounting for like pitching changes um, or or you're not doing that well, so you don't have the closer coming in in the ninth inning you're going to end up having this weird kind of skewed projection where it's going to be biased, you know, against teams that have really good closers or whatever. You're, so you really have to account for all this stuff in order for a simulation to be good. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, I think that we've done that, you know, we've been, been doing this for six, seven years with this MLB simulator. So I think we're, we're doing a good job with that, but yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's a tough task for sure. So then I guess that, that kind of almost leads to the question here why simulate baseball? Uh, why not just project the game on the averages, try to get as accurate of average projections as possible? Why take the extra step and say that you want to take this method where there is additional risk, uh, where uh, a, a wrong assumption could potentially compound and, and totally mess up your entire range of outcomes? Uh, why, why go about it this, this way? Uh, can I take this one? Yes, please yeah. do. <laughs> um, so, I mean, for one, it's, it's fun. It's like a really fun challenge to do. <laughs> Uh, I may be I may be crazy for saying that, but I like thoroughly enjoy it. Um, another reason is just that baseball lends itself really well to a simulation approach. Mm -hmm. um, so each at bat is essentially like an independent event. Like you can simulate the outcome of one at bat, update the game state, and then do the next at bat. And it, it's a uh, a bit easier than football in that manner because like with football, there's sort of you know running clocks and etc. Whereas baseball is very like individual like event after event after event mm -hmm. um so it, it sort of lends itself to it in that manner where you can do it with a, a high degree of accuracy if you're getting those like uh, if you're accurately updating the game states and everything like that you can do it really well um and then i think like the third reason at least for me is like the dfs performance where you can you know get like an average projection just doesn't really do much for you in baseball you mm -hmm. want to know how those runs are scored how a team's going to perform how a chalkier team's going to perform like you know there, there's a lot of like extra nuance that is really valuable in dfs um that you can't get from an average projection gotcha okay cool so I, I, one more question i have here and i guess this this gets a little bit into you know some specifics of how saberson works but obviously so we're we're simulating the game of baseball to generate the full range of outcomes but along with that we have the average projections it would it be enough to use a simulation based approach to try to generate average projections alone uh and and basically you know have is it is enough to say we're using simulations we're generating average projections and because we simmed these games these average projections are better than the rest of the industry i don't think so okay I think that you're exposing yourself to more risks like Matt covered and mm -hmm. you're not getting some of the upside value of it. Uh, whereas like, like you, you're essentially running the risk of, of misprojecting any of those like numerous factors that you have to tweak in to get right. And then you're only getting the summary number out of it. Right. Uh, as opposed to sort of like really a lot of the useful data points and statistics that we're able to capture from that. What are some of those data points and, and statistics that, that come out of the, the sims we have. Yeah, I, I'd say correlations on like higher end performance. Um, so obviously like everyone knows stacking, you know, correlate your batters and everything's like that. But uh, like 
it's significantly different if you say hold a constant of like this team scores a lot of runs and you look at like their upside correlation that matt talked about yesterday where it's like mm -hmm. the the how correlated those players are in high upside scenarios which is like what you're looking for in dfs um and you're just you're by capturing that by getting the percentiles by by being able to see like this is a higher upside pitcher because they're you know a, a low contact pitcher and maybe more likely to have like a complete game shutout or something like that um there's a lot of sort of like those nuanced things that i think we do a really good job of capturing yeah definitely i i want to add on that that uh will's absolutely right that by just if we only provided the mean projection from the mm -hmm. sim um I, I think if we if you do the sim well which we do then there is value in having just the mean projection from mm -hmm. a sim versus having a mean projection from another way of generating them um, obviously there's the higher risk but i think you do get value because being able to combine all like these dozens of factors that go into a game into a simulator you are going to get more accurate projections that way than mm -hmm. if you just do it with like a um, kind of a normal like linear regression or something like that yeah um, because of just the way that all these variables interact it's such a complicated relationship between all, between all the variables that you can only really do that the most accurate way, way with the sim um, but if you're going to be simulating the game right and you have like all of these possible outcomes why would you just then publish a single number that summarizes them and so yeah it's, it's it's like if we're doing this why wouldn't we um have provide all this other data and all these other especially for dfs and for you know gpp tournament play where what you what everybody cares about is getting those top one percent point one percent outcomes like that's mm -hmm. what matters for playing dfs um the average projection isn't really going to help you that much in getting those top one percent outcomes it's having true simulations with these ranges of outcomes where we can actually look at how often players are hitting top one percent how often combinations of players are kind of hitting those ceiling outcomes and building lineups using that data and so that's really like where that simulation approach has way way more value than in just providing mean projections gotcha cool so you you kind of hinted at it, I guess, or, or I mean, with the idea of it's it's kind of like a video game where we're looking at an at bat. Um, can you briefly kind of just walk me through uh, a sim, basically from from start to finish? So it's the the start of the game, the leadoff hitter, I guess, comes up to bat. What what happens next? Yeah, so uh, I'll start. Will feel free to chime in after you know because I know you, you've been really deep into this uh, lately, but. Basically what happens is, so yeah, the leadoff batter comes to bat. And so we have um, a bunch of different factors that each mm -hmm. are sort of um, treated similarly in that uh, we have basically like these context neutral projections for all these different factors. And so that's sort of like we take years and years, like tens or hundreds of thousands of individual plays. And we kind of, we generate these context neutral um, projections for all these factors. So that's the factors are obviously players, batters, and pitchers. But like I mentioned before, there's weather and umpire, and you know the um, sort of like the base out state, like who who's on um, the bases and how many mm -hmm. outs there are. All these different factors, and we uh, use these formulas essentially to combine them into these rates of all the different events. So we'll take these dozens of factors, we'll combine them in to create like the probability of the player hitting a home run. Okay, if they don't hit a home run, what's the probability that the, they're going to hit a ball that gets caught or that they're going to get a strikeout or a single double triple? So there's all these different events that can happen. And we basically just stick those probabilities into a uh, essentially a random number generate. Like it, it's a weighted run, you know, number gen generator that mm -hmm. it's as if you put a, you know, a hundred different like colored balls in, in a bucket and then you pick one out and you say, okay, well, it's a home run. And so then we add a run to the, uh, the away team's total and we get to the next batter and maybe they get a walk. And so then now there's a runner on first and it's the third batter. And so we just repeat that over and over. But every time the rates are changing a bit because the state of the game is different, the players that are involved in the play are different. And so it's this really complex, like every 
every play is almost like it's this unique formula that's combining all these different uh all these different probabilities into kind of the, the final probability of the events that can happen in a play gotcha that it, it's really interesting so yeah i mean i think especially because of the way that baseball just kind of looks as you're watching the game it has a very one-on-one -on -one feeling to it uh pitcher versus batter at least in that particular instance but what i'm hearing you say here is that you know there's actually a lot of context involved in terms of actually calculating a, a probability and that there's a, a material difference in the probabilities of a batter having different outcomes at the plate based on what has happened in the game up to that point is that correct yeah that's definitely part of it i mean i would say that the the context in that sense of like what has happened so far is generally going to be for baseball. It's generally less important than, mm -hmm. for example, for N NBA or NFL, like the score matters a lot more NFL yeah. in particular, like the team that's losing will be, have a vastly different strategy than the team that's winning in the fourth quarter. Whereas for MLB, it's not quite as stark of a difference. Gotcha. Um, you're, you're not going to see major differences in home run rates between a team that's losing by a lot and winning by a lot. Um, but you know, who's on base matters, mm -hmm. um, obviously. And then I think who ends up, you know, doing those pitching changes makes a big difference. So if a team is up by one run going into the seventh, eighth inning, they're going to pitch their better pitchers. And that is something that, um, you know, we're accounting for in the bullpen management of, you know, the state of the game kind of depends who impacts who's pitching, which is a big factor. So that's, that's probably the most significant way that the state of the game affects the uh those probabilities is like who is pitching and who and even like subbing batters in and out uh, yeah we do a bit of that as well so yeah so what does that look like how do we model uh bullpen usage and the the chance of a different starter getting pulled versus staying in the game or, or what does that look like yeah so uh, i'll take this one we yeah, uh that's what I've been working on uh, lately is is basically um, obviously we're, we're tracking, you know, their expected pitches like, you know, we're you know expecting them to throw 90 pitches on average mm -hmm. in this game. Um, and then the in the game, the pitches they've thrown so far, um, the runs they've given up a, as well as like a, a separate factor from that is the run differential in the game. Uh, so, you know, if they've given up seven runs, but, you know, they've scored 15 it's less important than if like, you know, they've given up seven runs and it's tied right. seven, seven. Um, so like run differential runs, their pitches that they've thrown and then their expected pitches. Um, and we essentially come up with a probability that they're going to get pulled or not. Um, and we try to figure out who like they would most likely be replaced with. Um, and we just slot them in there and, and mark them in as the new pitcher if they've been pulled or, you know, let them run a little bit if, you know, it rolls and it's not that probability. So. Gotcha. Cool. And and Matt, you had mentioned pinch hitting as well. I think. Um, it, do we do any modeling of of that likelihood to get pinch hit for? And yeah, that? we we do have the uh, likelihood of batters getting pinch hit in the okay. sim, uh, and so that's you know right right now we're not doing too much with like differentiating that based on the state of the game. We do, um, I believe, we do look at the handedness of the opposing pitcher. Should not positive about that, but I think we. But we, we definitely have the likelihood of each batter just based on like his recent historical data of them getting pinch hit or not. Um, so, you know, often teams will have platoon batters where they'll only start uh, against lefties or righties. Uh, and then once the pitcher changes, they'll get swapped out for the other one. So those are batters where they're going to have a more limited upside because they might, you know, or maybe a more limited floor. Either way, they're going to have a lower projection, right? Because they're going to, have just fewer play appearances per game. So that's that's an area where we are incorporating it, but there's, I think, more even that we could do that, that mm -hmm. we're planning on kind of improving on as the uh, season progresses of like being smarter about those sub substitutions. But yeah, we are doing that. And then we're doing that with pitchers as well. So because we have a simulation-based approach, um, you know, if a pitcher come uh, an NL, well, I guess it's universal DH now, so this becomes less relevant. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So it used to be when there were pitchers that batted, we would sub them out when they got up in a certain situation. Now it's universal DH, so not quite, uh, we don't have that impact anymore, but 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the the DH and, and some of the other changes this year as we move along. Um, I, a couple other, I guess, kind of just quick questions on the the Sims themselves. Are there any other, you know, factors that you would kind of describe as as uniquely baseball? Um, anything that that particularly shows up when you're when you're simulating baseball that you have to think about for this sport that maybe doesn't come up as a big factor for for other sports? I think umpire. That would be my vote for okay. that factor. Uh, that mm -hmm. is when I first started working on it like a, a little over a year ago. It's like, well, we're really accounting for that. Um, but yeah, it, it's like it has a meaningful impact on the strikeout rate. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if some, you know, umps have a wider zone or a larger zone, like it, it is, that is something that seems kind of small and ridiculous, but has a significant impact on the game. I know Absolutely. I've seen like some Twitter accounts that have published like the, the runs that, uh, you know, an ump has cost a team over the course of a game. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's my, my vote for, you know, a small factor that is meaningfully, you know, impactful and uniquely baseball. What What's important to look at when you're thinking about umpires in terms of the way that it affects the, the outcomes of a game? So I think, I mean, for me, what I would say is it's the most important thing to look at for umpires is to not uh, overreact to like small sample sizes. And yeah. so I think the, because we're accounting for umps in a smart way where we're including them in this like very um, advanced like model where we do proper like regression towards the mean and account for these sample sizes. We're accounting, you know, if, if an up has five games where pitchers are getting 50% more strikeouts, that's like a they, probably a small impact on their like true uh, rate. And so I mean, I, I agree with Will that you see a lot of Twitter accounts that are like, oh, this is the impact of these umps on run scoring. Yeah. But there's so much noise in that data that you do have to be really careful about how you're looking at that. That said, with umps that have a really large sample of data, you can see even if they have, you know, say that that this some umpire, um, because they have like an inch wider strike zone, pitchers are getting 5% more strikeouts. That sounds small, but over the course, I mean, that that's a pretty decent impact. And it doesn't just impact, yeah, pitchers get more strikeouts, but batters obviously get fewer hits. And it like really just has a cascading effect on the whole game. And so that's something where um, I would personally, I would never try to like uh, incorporate that into my own process, like outside of yeah. rather than just sort of trusting like that a smarter model is going to be able to do that because it's very difficult to just look at the umpire stats and be like, okay, I guess I'll bump this pitcher up maybe, you know, so that, that's the kind of thing that you really want to have like a more uh, statistically valid model to, or sim to account for that kind of thing. Gotcha. And I mean, so I know I, I have a sense of like, there's some umpires that maybe are a little more generally favorable to pitching uh, some that maybe are a little more generally favorable to hitters. There's also a spectrum of just good umpires, consistent umpires and and probably bad umpires. Is that something that we take into account? Like the, the variance of an individual ump of how accurate their calls will be throughout the game beyond whether they're like on average beneficial more to pitchers or hitters. So not the variance for that isn't umpire specific. We do account for it's, it's called binomial variance, which is essentially like if, this rate is a 70% probability and we have this sample size. Yeah. What we think it's 70%, but it can likely fall between say 68 and 72%. So we are incorporating sort of variance in our assumptions, Yeah. Uh, but it is not, we're not attempting to sort of apply that variance directly to a specific umpire or player. Uh, I think yeah. oftentimes that can be, it's more a result of a small sample size than mm -hmm. it is like, yeah it's not necessarily that that umpire is crazy. It's that, you know, that umpire uh, is, we, we're only looking at 20 games and he's had 10 left side and 10 right side. Uh, yeah. So I think we do a pretty good job of accounting for that variance, but yeah, yeah. It, it's at a, a more general level. And the other thing with, with umps is uh, they obviously have a huge sample size of individual pitches. And so if an ump is just bad and they're like calling the exact same pitch, a ball and a strike from one pitch to the next, that's actually going to like smooth out a probably like pretty well, even just over the course of a game. So you're not going to have too much variance, like on a game level for an inconsistent up because like just in the course of a game, they'll probably like go mostly like one side or the other will sort of like even out. Yeah. So 
it's like frustrating to watch as a fan and i'm sure yeah. as a player it's frustrating but probably from a dfs impact it, it's not going to have a huge effect um outside of just you know the small sample size noise that will mentioned gotcha Cool. Well, b- before I bury us in an hour long stream about uh, how we handle umpires, I, one of the other questions that I wanted to ask, I, whether we talked about yesterday is an important factor here in, in baseball DFS. I think, I mean, it's, it's important in some ways to all sports played outside, but feels like a very uniquely baseball thing, uh, at least to me in terms of the way that it can affect projections. A win game at Wrigley Field, for example, is always the classic example. How do we incorporate weather into our model? I'll start with that. So the main factors are uh, temperature and wind. Mm -hmm. And then obviously, uh, whether the park is being played in a dome uh, impacts whether, you know, (laughs) whether even matters. Uh, But that is a thing, you know, there are a number of parks that have uh, retractable roofs. And so Mm -hmm. knowing whether the roof, the roof is open or closed matters. Um, But really, the main things we've looked at other types of like the effect of humidity and um, some other weather factors. And generally it's like temperature is by far the most important. Um, And then wind is second, but even wind um, has a much different impact based on different parks. So the, the biggest example of that is Wrigley field. That's where the wind has like by far the biggest effect. And you see that in Vegas lines too. If Mm -hmm. the wind is blowing like out towards, um, towards the outfield at like, 10 to 15 degrees um that's probably going to increase like the game total by like two full runs or maybe more over the average which is just absurd and then it's vice versa if it's blowing in it's gonna vastly decrease the scoring so that is incorporated into the sim for most parts the the uh, temperature is the biggest thing um and i think it is important um when you're thinking about the temperature that it is more than just home runs. So the biggest impact is kind of how far the ball flies. So when it's hotter, basically the ball flies further because of physics. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so there's more home runs in hotter weather. But when you get to the extremes, it actually has some effects on other stats as well, like strikeouts and walks, where if it's super cold, I think um, pitchers have a harder time gripping the ball and then on the other side i think if it's like so hot that like pitchers are super sweaty like it's it has impacts there and i don't i mean i don't want to like apply all this like guesswork into why things are this way but when you look at the statistics and and the probabilities um you know the the temperature actually does have these interesting effects on not just home run rates especially at the extremes but yeah it's definitely something to that's important to factor in uh, it, I think, again, similar to umpire, it's important not to overreact to small sample sizes where mm-hmm. you'll see some like tools out there that'll be like, oh, like the weather impact for this game is plus 30% to home runs because there's been like three games in the past with these conditions where they were high scoring. And you want to be really careful about not overreacting to small sample sizes there. Um, and you also want to be careful not to conflate the temperature and the park where, um, you know, games that are in hot uh environments on on average um the park and the temperature are obviously correlated and so you don't want to double count that effect so uh that's something that you know our say the saberson model does well and that's kind of just built into how we create projections is that we account for that like correlation between the variables but if you're looking at it yourself you you don't you want to be careful about not double counting and not overreacting to small sample sizes just in terms of kind of doing that personal research and whatnot and i will say on the sample side that's like i'd say probably the biggest thing that i've done here working at saber sim it's it's like my favorite subject every time we start a new sport (laughs) get to yell at matt about our initial regression values and yeah all of like the you know to carry that that stuff's just fascinating to me and i think that's something that we do really well as far as determining not just like let's not over regress this or let's not under regress it but like we can sort of solve for the optimal amount of how much to you know weigh a certain sample size um so that's something that i think that our model is is really really strong at gotcha. and just to just to expand on that um if you don't know what like regression is or regressing is basically it's just like how much um like a sample of data matters in terms of like in terms of predicting the future. 
So it's basically saying if we say we have five games of data, um, it, that's going to have a different impact on different um, statistics. So like a strikeout rate is one of the um, most stable statistics. So if you have five games of data on a pitcher's strikeout rate, that's going to tell you a lot more than if you have five games of uh, a pitcher's home run rate. Um, and so similar, so basically what Will's talking about with that regression is saying, how are we, um, when we take, you know, some number of um, plate appearances or games mm -hmm. for some factor like weather or like umpire, it's how are we taking those numbers and then getting an accurate prediction out of them that's accounting for sort of the innate randomness that goes into the numbers. And so, yeah, like Will said that he's worked a lot on that and we feel really good about like, how we're really strong at at doing that in a statistically uh valid um way that's and mathematically valid like we, we've really like dug into like the math of this yeah. and like we're literally will and i've like done these like math equations of like figuring out how the variance works and and how to like do these regression values and so it's that and then it's like how much does a game a day ago impact the projection compared to a game a year ago and that's the other uh factor there is like how how quickly do we react to recent data and that's that's kind of the other thing so it's the regression and then it's like this decay rate that we call it which is how quickly we're, we're reacting to recency gotcha and if i'm understanding correctly i mean this would apply to pretty much everything that you were treating as a valuable factor in terms of yep. projecting performance this isn't this isn't just weather. This isn't just umpires. This would be yeah. like virtually every single factor you have to come up with. How important is this thing? But also in a world where we don't have perfect information, perfect sample sizes, how much can we weight the thing in this situation? Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So I, everything batters, pitchers, parks, weather, temperature, like it, it all, it all has its own special values. Gotcha. Yeah, for each stat. So it ends up being like hundreds of different values because it's like <laughs> batter single rate, batter home run rate, pitcher yeah. home run, like it's all of these, it combines. And so we, we literally have just like these hundreds of like values that we're using to kind of regress and um, regress these rates. So, yeah. Gotcha. Well, maybe I'll, I'll pick out one uh, of maybe one of those hundreds here because Matt, you had mentioned it a second ago. And I, I wanted to talk about the, uh, the how ballparks affect the game. You had mentioned that uh, we have weather and that it's correlated to park factors, but that that's not a perfect correlation, that there's some independent factor that a ballpark the game's being played in affects the game anyway. what Can you talk a little bit about how that comes into play? Yeah. I mean, one of the cool things about baseball is that every park is different. So uh -huh. it's not, you know, it's not like other sports where there's these specified dimensions of the field. It's pretty unique in that way. And that like, every park literally has a different distance to the outfield wall. You need to hit the ball a different distance depending on where you are in order to get a home run, mm -hmm. um, which is actually kind of like when you step back and think about it, it's kind of wild that there's like yeah. not a standardized um, park dimension like there is for literally like every other sport. But it, it's really cool because it means that there's just like these differences in all of these different rates based on the park. And it's not just the like outfield distance, but it's how much foul ball territory, um, uh, foul territory is there. So like in the Oakland A's park, there's like a ton of foul territory. And so it's a lot more likely that if a player hits a foul ball, it's going to get caught rather than just be a strike. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so every fa every park has just different projected rates for all the different events. Um, you know, some, so Coors Field is, is the, the famous one for being very hitter friendly park that's actually not related to the dimensions of the park at all but more the elevation so higher elevation means thinner air which means the ball goes farther mm -hmm. so in cores um there's just higher scoring in general um basically all of the offensive uh statistics are inflated in cores because of the elevation and you'll see that in vegas totals you'll see that in our simulated totals but then, you know, there's just every park is is unique in that way. And so some like the Giants park is very pitcher friendly, um, you know, like I said, Coors and like um, an interesting one that we've actually spent some time accounting for is Baltimore, which uh, used to be very hitter friendly. They mm -hmm. just moved the walls um, and changed the height of them as well, I believe. 
And so there's, it's actually a, a quite different park that's much, much pitcher friend, more pitcher friendly now. So we've done some digging into the stats around that and making some adjustments that we'll, we'll kind of see how the park plays out in the first few weeks and probably continue to tinker with that a little bit because no one really knows how that's going to play out, but we've accounted for that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, it's interesting to see how that park impacts the scoring, but you'll definitely see it when there's Coors, you know, the, the Rockies park on the slate, yeah. but even other ones, you know, just the, the projections are going to be different based on where they're playing. Great American small park, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> That's another one. I feel like I, when the Reds are at home, it's always uh, a pretty high total game. Uh, you, yeah. you mentioned um, Vegas uh, just a second ago when talking about, you know, playing a game in Coors, uh, our projections are going to increase. Uh, also, Vegas' uh, to run totals are going to be increased. To what extent is is Vegas involved in our in our model for, for baseball? So uh, it is a factor. Um, and that's something that we've kind of been we've gone back and forth on that over the years of mm -hmm. we want to be uh, independent of Vegas because we want to have kind of projections that are our own. And we've always felt very confident about the Saberson model and we've always performed really well compared to Vegas. So like over the past many years, like our game projections are on par with the Vegas, um, you know, money lines and totals in terms of accuracy. Um, that said, we are implementing more of kind of these adjustments to not stray too far from Vegas. Um, and that's not just, you know, it's partly just to partly because we want to get more accurate. There, there are biases in our model, like there are in any model, um, especially like we said, simulations have a higher risk of just one flawed assumption making a right. big impact on the final score. And so we want to make sure that if there's something that the model's missing, which we will we will miss things because it's a complicated model, that we're going to be kind of, we have these guide rails in place to adjust towards Vegas, which is a very safe, sophisticated, like that is based on real money that professional gamblers that know what they're doing are, they're kind of making those lines. Mm -hmm. And so they're gonna be pretty safe. Um, and even if it's not a bias and we just kind of have, feel like we, we disagree with Vegas, um, we still want to be careful about straying too far just because, like I said, the the value of the simulation-based approach isn't necessarily like the mean projection. It's like the value that you get from these ranges of outcomes, from the right. correlations, the upside correlations. And so even if we exactly matched Vegas in terms of like all of the run totals, in terms of all the player props, everything, which we're not going to do, but even if we did, you'd have a huge amount of value over the field because of the way that we're creating these ranges of outcomes. And so we want to make sure that users, you know, have projections that are like safe, that you're not you're not going to be exposed to these either biases or risks from string too far from the field while still getting the value um, that comes from the simulation based approach. So, yeah, I know it's kind of like a long answer, but I, I just I think it is important to talk about that. And it is something that we've really we're discussing a lot internally of like for all sports is how do we want to incorporate Vegas? But the main goal is like we don't we want to make sure that we're being we have these guide rails in place so that yeah. any sort of bias or or um, false assumption is not going to stray too far from from reality. Gotcha. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we've been talking about a couple other sports where Vegas is more of a primary factor maybe in some some of these sports the primary factor uh it, that's not the case here more of something that we're kind of using to, to check ourselves as we move exactly. along gotcha and yeah. i think that, that was a really interesting point that you made too of that uh, essentially if you have an implied total for a team uh on a slate that that number is actually essentially a mean projection that's vegas's mean projection for the team total yep. of the game and that comes with the same issues that mean projections have for individual players in baseball just as easily that, I mean, there's that, the irony is that, you know, the, the mean projection for uh, the Dodgers that cores is 6.2 runs that they can't even score 6.2 runs. That's actually not a possible outcome. Uh, it's, it's just descriptive of the entire sample and, and has the same issues there. Yep. Um, absolutely. Cool. One, one of the other questions I had wanted to ask, especially thinking about sample sizes, um, is how we think about dealing with minor league players. I know that's kind of an issue uh, 
uh, for all sports. You've got a, a set of rookies entering the the um, the sport every year, but for baseball in particular, you've got a much bigger pool of, of minor league players that have the ability to, availability to be called up. How do we deal with that? Uh, if you know somebody's starting their first game in the majors, whether they've got a, a rich uh, history of minor league data or not. Yeah, so that, that's my other uh, really big project of, of okay. this off season is uh, it's we call it call it minor league equivalency, um, and it, essentially it's we we have all of their stats from you know double A, triple A, um, and so we can you know measure like we have the park factor the same way as we do like at Camden Yards Park. We mm-hmm. have, you know, whatever park they're playing at in double A. Um, and so we, we're able to generate the rates in the same way. Uh, and then my sort of like the work that I've been doing is how do we adjust that? So, uh, you know, a player who is, you know, very good in double A might just be good in triple A. And he's going to get called up because he's at the top of double A. But then it, you should obviously expect a decrease in his performance because he's facing better players. Um, so that's something that I've like worked really hard on is getting sort of like the optimal adjustments to each of like the individual stats that we're looking at. Like, you know, are they going to, if they're hitting less home runs, where is that sort of shifting to? Is it, are they, is it because they're striking out more or is it because the walls are further back and they're flying out more? Um, so sort of looking at all of that and adjusting them, um, as well as sort of combining, uh, I'll try not to get too like bogged down in it, but the adjusting the regression value. So we do independent regression values for a double A player. Like their rates are sort of like more variant than a triple A player or a major league player. Um, so adjusting those regression values to sort of get them in the correct context when they're called up to the major, major leagues. Gotcha. And is it, is it true or that like, so a triple A player gets called up into the majors is the just general expectation that they just get worse at everything uh or is it a little more complicated than that like somebody you know do they th- does their theoretical batting average come down and their home run rate come down and their ability to get down on base all comes down as they get into a harder league or yeah so it's it's a it's a bit twofolded so one they're just facing better pitchers. So uh-huh. out, uh, the way we look at it is we sort of have context neutral for everybody. So we have like this batter against any pitcher, like just a, if you took a random pitch, like his average mm-hmm. context neutral. Um, and so it's it's a mix of that and also just facing a pitcher who's going to throw less. But yeah, we see their contact rates decline. Uh, but, you know, one thing that we see increase is their home run per contact rate. And part of that is, you know, like obviously pitchers are throwing – 100 mile an hour fastballs which you can take it further than if you were hitting like an 85 mile an hour fastball um so it's it's a bit more nuanced than just like bring everything down and obviously some stats are more effective it's like strikeout is going to go up because they're facing better pitchers and they're just not as good relative to the rest of the you know majors as they were in you know triple a gotcha cool um i have a couple kind of, I guess I would say almost summary questions about the Sims themselves uh, here before we jump into a a few of the things that we've done for this season in particular. Um, The first, I mean, thinking about all the factors we've talked about here, and Matt, you mentioned the the hundreds of different factors that are um, kind of coming into play here. Is there something that you guys commonly hear talked about when discussing projecting or or, or predicting or even simulating baseball, um, or even just in DFS strategy broadly that gets talked about as a factor that's important that you guys have found maybe isn't really predictive or is too noisy or just isn't very useful information. Yeah. So, I mean, the famous one is um, batter versus pitcher (laughs) Uh, BVP as people like to call it. So a lot of people will look at, you know, the specific matchup between an individual batter and an individual pitcher and say, okay, they've got, you know, 30 different 30 plate appearances um, where this batter pays, pays this pitcher and he's batting 400 with uh, five home runs. And so, you know, he's going to be a good play for tonight. Uh, you know, this is one that's been analyzed uh, very extensively. And I don't know that anybody has really found st- statistically uh, significant um, results there. Yeah. Um, I think the main, I mean, there's a lot of different reasons for that. Like the main one is sample size. It's very, very difficult to get a big enough 
sample size between a batter and a pitcher where mm-hmm. there's just statistically um, relevant. Like, even if there's a true um, performance increase when a certain batter faces a certain pitcher, um, in order to, like, just get results that uh, that have enough data to be true, you have to get, like, hundreds, probably, of plate appearances, and that's yeah. hard to get. And if you do get them, then it's going to be over, like, many years. Right where the pitcher has changed, the batter has changed. And so it's like, yeah, maybe like John Lester against like, uh, who's an old uh, MLB bat, like, I don't know, Pujols. Ryan Braun or Pujols or whatever. Yeah, it's like, yeah, maybe they have like a few hundred, uh, you know, plate appearances, but like it's, you know, John Lester in, in 2008 is a lot different than John Lester now. I mean, those two probably don't actually have that much together, but you know what I'm saying. It's like pitchers and batters has changed too much for the uh, the first part of that um, that matchup to be relevant. So that's something where you know you might get lucky and see see this matchup where they have really good numbers, and you're like, all right, I'm going to boost this guy, and then maybe they actually are good. I'm not saying that it doesn't exist because anybody that's like played baseball is like, oh well, clearly like you see some pitchers better. And I don't want to deny that it's true, but the, it's really hard to uh, get anything relevant from the actual data there. So that's that's one thing. Um, I think the other thing that comes to mind is like hot streaks. Uh, you know, the hot hand. That's another thing that's been analyzed a lot. Um, I highly recommend um, the book by Tom Tango, which is like a very old um, kind of sabermetrics book, but it's like one of the it's like the Bible of sabermetrics. Uh, mm-hmm. It has a lot of um, different uh, analyses of this kind of thing. And they, they look at the hot hand and there's again, very little statistical evidence for hot streaks being real. Um, again, th- there's something where there probably it is real. If you look at, you know, it, in reality, but like the stats are just really hard to tell the difference between a hot streak and um, noise. And so if you're trying to actually incorporate that into your process, you're probably more likely to just be like making random changes that are minus EV than actually getting a real, you know, statistically significant, uh, you know, value from that. And probably making an adjustment that's getting you a little chalkier too, if, if a lot of other people are following like recent form of what players have done. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, cool. I, what would you say is overall the biggest and maybe the most unique challenge to simulating baseball in particular, something that stands out, uh, compared to other sports is this is kind of what makes doing this for baseball uniquely a little more challenging. I know you're putting you on the spot. Yeah. Yeah. This is a really good question. I I mean, I do think, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, if you have something in mind, I, (laughs) <laughs> I'm thinking on more. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the um, the pitcher management, it, like we talked about before, is one of the most challenging parts mm-hmm. of it um, because it's sort of similar to uh, some parts of like NFL where you're trying to simulate human decisions. Um, man- simulating pitcher management is you're simulating manager decisions, which is hard to do yeah. to like <laughs> um, be able to successfully like project what a human is going to decide that a very um, illogical imperfect human at that. Right. Um, so I would say that that's one of the most challenging things is like, yeah, when is a starting pitcher going to get pulled? Who's going to come in from the bullpen? It's this very complicated logic that um, I think we do a good job with it now. I think we uh, can do a better job of it. And we are like actively working on, on improving that aspect of it. Cause I think it's one of those things that's, that there's there's more that we can do there um but that's probably what i would say is like the most challenging uh, one of the most challenging parts of simulating baseball in particular yeah i think uh, on my end like more of the data side is really the the minor league adjustments Mm -hmm. i think that's it's a really tricky one because obviously like players are getting called up from double h triple a you know majors but it's just they're they're very different like the the leagues play meaningfully different um, and so adjusting those stats it takes a lot of care to do it properly. Like you, you can, uh, a small tweak really can multiply very quickly from that. And you yeah. can get like 
you know, a rookie projected for 15 points on, on DraftKings, which is like not going to happen. If, if it's, uh, I, I feel like that was a really tricky, like one that I, I guess I'm really proud of, I think mm -hmm. where we're at with it. Um, but yeah, I think that's probably like one of the trickiest things is there's so much data there that you want to use. Like you don't want to just like assume this rookie is, you know, like a comparison. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it is very tricky to sort of accurately incorporate all of it. Gotcha. And it, it seems like on both fronts with both like kind of the bullpen and the leash of starting pitchers and with minor leagues that we're uh, modeling it in some capacity. It's something that's captured in the model. Do you think for, for either of those, I guess I'll ask you each in turn, uh, that there is an opportunity for a, a user to add value to what we're trying to do with these things? And, and how would you recommend somebody go about knowing intimately how the actual models for these things are, are built? Yeah, so there's definitely value to be added. So, I mean, I will tell you, in terms of the minor league one first, um, we aren't accounting for their prospect status. So I'll just be upfront with that. So um, we look at all of the minor league statistics and we base <laughs> our stuff off of that. But currently, we might add this in the future, but currently we aren't looking at, like, are they a top 10 prospect? And so, like, you can probably add value by, like, bumping up a highly rated prospect that has bad minor league numbers or vice versa, a um, prospect that's not in the top 100 but has really good minor league numbers, we might be slightly over projecting because if they're not highly rated, then that probably means there's something in like the scouting report that yeah. indicates that they're not going to translate to the major leagues as well as their numbers might suggest. So I think that is an opportunity to add value. Um, on like the pitching rotation front, um, you know, if you know that a manager is like more likely to pull a pitcher quickly, um, just based on their tendencies, that can be something to add. You know, we're not differentiating between different managers in that mm -hmm. regard. It does kind of bake into like the pitcher's average pitch count projection, where if someone has this manager that's very conservative with um, like the pitcher leash. That's going to be baked into their pitch count, but yeah, it's still like you might have some limited upside for a pitcher that like you know this manager is never going to let this pitcher go over 90 pitches no matter how well he's doing mm -hmm. uh that's going to like really cap their ceiling and that's something that is maybe baked into the mean pitching pitch count projection but isn't necessarily like in this sim that we always remove them at 90 pitches um so that's what comes to mind i don't know if will has anything else there but yeah, nothing for you. I, I think minor leagues are going to be the, the easiest quick thing on it is mm -hmm. I, I know like we saw Wander Franco come up uh, last year that comes to mind where it's like if yeah. Uh, like, yeah, we, what we know are his minor league stats. And I think that we do a really good job of of translating those into what sort of the major league rates would be. Mm -hmm. uh, but like Wander Franco is like, what is he like the number three prospect or something like on? I think he was number one. Maybe. Oh, yeah. So yeah. th there is definitely something where, like, we probably were under on him. I I'm not sure. But, like, those, yeah, I think those are specifically like, the best places to add value on it. Yeah. I do want to point out that we do, it, it's not just the statistics with the minor leaguers because we mm -hmm. do have um, the their the age uh, matters, the, the uh, their, like, position. But the, the, I think the age is a pretty big factor. If a 19-year-old comes up to the majors, there's obviously not a huge sample of those, but we do account for those players are generally much better because you don't get to the majors at 19 unless you're like a top, unless you're like Bryce Harper or wonder. I think he was either 19 or 20. So that does matter. If you're 27 and you're making your debut, you're going to be worse. Um, so just want to point that out that like the age is a factor there, but still I think there's some added value, like Will said in, in the, uh, like the prospect status. Gotcha. Cool. And, and one one quick note, just something you mentioned, Matt, in a situation where uh, there is an explicit pitch count that we're aware of, that is something mm -hmm. that we capture in the way we simulate the game, right? If if the, the manager actually just straight up comes and says he's not pitching more than 90, that's something that we reflect in our the way that we simulate the game? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's obviously it's not, we don't force them to throw 90 because like if they go out there and get shell shocked in the first inning right like they're gonna get pulled right yeah, yeah uh but yeah yeah we are incorporating like if a manager says like this is his stop gotcha yeah cool so let's let's jump here and talk a little bit about uh this season in particular um we'll start from the standpoint of uh the 
the model or the, the Sims themselves. I know we've kind of hinted at this, talked about this a little bit throughout the stream, but um, can you, can both of you really kind of summarize, I guess, what's new this season in particular? We mentioned bullpen. Uh, we mentioned that some of the minor league work, but what, if someone were to open up the hood and take a look, um, what would stand out as being new uh, for, for this year? Go ahead, Will. You're the one that's been working on this stuff. Yeah, uh, so I mean, that the bulk of my stuff so far really has been in those two areas. It's okay. been, um, you know, obviously MLB was the first model that I worked on when I joined Saber Sim. Mm -hmm. um, and then since then, you know, worked on Same. like like seven. <laughs> <laughs> Where it worked on like a, a bunch more models. So I, I sort of got a lot of insights specifically on uh, like sort of regression and decay stuff. So that was the, the first thing that I went in and improved. So I think that uh, in general, we've just seen an accuracy increase on mm -hmm. a lot of our stats because of that. Um, it's obviously like they're relatively minor things. Like it's not like we were way off, but it, they're like those small improvements there. Um, and then minor leaguers, I think that you'll see us modeling them more accurately. So I think in some cases, there there was definitely a dichotomy. There were some minor leaguers that we were consistently over on and some minor leaguers consistently under on. And I think we've sort of found the right balance for them. Um, and then I think that the, the other thing is just going to be in sort of like the bullpen and the pitcher leash. Um, and so sort of like, I would say the distributions of pitchers will probably be the third spot. I think the, to add to that, the, the other major thing that we're looking at is stolen bases. Um, oh, yeah. so yeah, that's like, <laughs> that's uh, what I'm working I think today. one, that's what Will's working on today. And he, uh, somehow forgot that was, just, <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, improving how we're modeling stolen bases is a big thing. So. I think just the way that we've done it um, in the past has been okay, but I think that is one of the weaker points, I would say, in the model. Um, so we're getting better at just being more accurate at predicting stolen bases based on you know the player tendencies and and recent data and stuff. We're also adding like catcher as um, a factor there, so we previously didn't account for like the strength of a catcher in stolen base rates. We will be doing that this season so obviously a catcher with a cannon arm is going to not just throw out more batters but batters are not going to be running on catchers like that as often um mm -hmm. and even the pitcher as well uh it's going to impact things you know there's the obvious like lefty a lefty pitcher generally is better at holding runners on but then certain pitchers like john lester is a famous example of, is just very very bad at that um there's obviously a lot of noise out there, and so we're looking at making sure that we're doing that in a um, way that's not just like pulling in kind of random noise. But yeah, I would say stolen bases are like the the other factor that um, we're really we, we've gotten a lot more data. So like we um, just like pulled in better data from like our our play by play in terms of stolen bases, and that we're yeah. incorporating that more strongly uh, into the model and into the sim. Gotcha. So what does the process look like for knowing if our improvements are actually making things better, especially in a sport where averages aren't even very common outcomes necessarily for, for some of these players? How do we know, you know, if we make a change uh, that we've improved, that we've gotten more accurate? Yeah. So for the bulk of, of what I'm doing uh, is is we sort of separate out the, the sim work and then the sim inputs. Uh -huh. uh, and so when I'm working on sort of how we create those sim inputs, uh, we have a variety of different like metrics that we use to test uh, an accuracy and we store the output of, of each thing. So I can go in and, and tweak, you know, say like this decay value um, and I can see how much did that adjust our, or like how did that change our accuracy of that stat specifically? Uh, so we're tracking all of that and then making sure that, you know, one, that the accuracy makes sense uh, i know like sometimes you can accidentally like introduce like future data or something like that and you have 100 percent accuracy which <laughs> is not possible mm -hmm. uh so we're, we're able to track that make sure that the accuracy is like realistic um and then also that it's improving so that we're you know we're limiting how far we're off um so yeah so that's the bulk of my work on the projection side uh and then we're also you know looking at like actual sim performance against sort of like the actual stats um as well as like vegas closing lines Gotcha. Cool. Yep. So we, we talked a little bit here about what's changed with the model. Um, there's obviously a few things that have changed with baseball this year. Um, touched on a couple of them. Matt, you mentioned the universal DH and, and we talked about the changes to Camden Yards. Um, I guess I'll, I'll leave this kind of as an, uh, as an open question to, to you guys. Uh, 
first, what are we doing to account for these things um, in the simulations? But is there any particular change to the game of baseball, professional baseball, I guess, specifically here this year that you think is going to have the biggest impact on our sims on, on, I guess, even uh, optimal DFS strategy? So, yeah, so I guess the first question is how are we adjusting for those things? So when it's when there's like a factor of like the Camden yards changing their dimensions, um, mm -hmm. generally that's just something that we kind of override. So we like have our input projections that we've been talking about, and we mm -hmm. essentially just like adjust those before running the sim because there's nothing really that we can like put into like it, it's a factor that's not in the data, and so we have to manually adjust. Sure. So, and and that's okay and like that i think that's the correct way of doing it so you know we're making manual adjustments based on sort of our research and we try to be as objective as possible there of like looking at the data looking um at experts and and how they're talking about the effect of this um so that that's how we do like camden yards is we just apply these adjustments to different stats um the in terms of like changes um you know one big thing is that all parks will be using a humidor now. Mm -hmm. um, that's a change from for the season that uh, some parks uh, over the past few seasons, they've been slowly adding it. So I think uh, Arizona was a one of the most impactful ones because it's such a dry climate. And so humidors um, basically have they it's where you put the ball in a like uh, machine that makes it like stabilizes the humidity like the moisture of the ball i, I don't know i'm not like a, phys a physics person but the basically it, I think. yeah like the temperature and the humidity of it and so basically it like standardizes that because um dry balls fly further so there's more home runs in dry uh dry climate so by adding a humidor to arizona it decreased scoring and, and home runs in particular so that's going to have a the biggest impacts on like these dry climates mm -hmm. um i honestly i don't remember off the top of my i we've talked about this as a team of how this is going to affect different parks i don't remember off the top of my head uh exactly what we're doing there but we are going to be accounting for the humidor in these places mm -hmm. um, and again kind of as the season starts as we see vegas lines and as we see the data rolling in we'll make adjustments right accordingly because um, anybody that's been following baseball for the past few years, there's been a lot of like controversy over changing the ball and yeah. um, like uh, whether MLB like actually changed the ball to decrease scoring. And then there's like the whole sticky substance ban. And so there's like a lot of these external factors that's really hard to bake into the model that we've had to kind of adjust for. And it's always sort of like we're just a lot of times we're having to react to this different news that isn't in the data that we know is going to be affecting the results. So that's something that we're just always kind of tinkering with. And you're immediately battling sample size problems there too. Like if, you know, right. uh, Park has a humidor this year and the first three games go way over the total, everybody's going to freak out and assume it's that. Right. Yep. Yeah. So uh, it, it something... might be that oh, or it. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. As you say, like that, the great thing about sample size is it might actually be that or it might not. And we can't know. Uh, so yeah, it, it's definitely a, a tricky situation, but I think that we'll, we'll do a good job of it. Yeah. Gotcha. Cool. Uh, I mean, for something like the, the, the universal DH, um, in terms of accounting for that in the SIM, is that as simple for us as just saying these are now the lineups? Now there's not a pitcher. It's just another batter in there. Yes. Is there an, <laughs> impact? yeah, I guess. Okay. So is there a, a, a an, an impact, a DFS impact um, beyond that. I mean, one of the things that comes to mind, I guess, for me is that you have these National League pitchers that have been more accustomed historically to throwing against one pitcher in the order. And that's reflective in their historical stats. Uh, yeah. They may appear to be better pitchers, at least slightly in a way that's maybe DFS relevant uh, than their American League uh, pitchers, just because they've faced an easier batter one out of every nine plate appearances uh, over time. How do we how do we reconcile that? How are we dealing with that in terms of projecting um, pitchers, I guess, and, and and also like the hitting performances here? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think that's a, a big value of the way that we're doing it. Um, mm -hmm. This this change, bad projection systems, it'll probably be obvious that they're not accounting for this well because they're not going to be punishing NL pitchers and not like you have to look at who 
the pitchers are actually facing yeah. when to create those stats. And if you're just looking at like season statistics and not accounting for who they're facing, then you're going to be not accounting for, you know, NL pitchers are going to be better than in your model than they actually are. Um, but yeah, I mean, Will, do you have something to add? No, I was just going to say, like, I, I think that, yeah, that, that is a really strong point of our model and that essentially any time that a, in like the historical data that we're looking at, that a pitcher has come up to bat against another pitcher, obviously that pitcher has, or the batter, <laughs> who is a pitcher, has more <laughs> stats to begin with. So, you know, striking out the pitcher uh, it is less, you know, meaningful. Like, you, they get less reward for that than if they were, you mm-hmm. know, striking out an elite batter, so. Yeah, and I do want to add that that carries over to, I think that that is a really big strength of the way that we create projections is that that carries over to any other factor too. If someone hits a home run in Coors, they get less um, less of a reward for that in terms of their like projection than if they hit a home run in you know San Francisco or in Wrigley with the wind blowing in. Like We have all these factors in the historical data and the way that we assign like value to the result of the play is completely de- is very dependent on those different factors and so like yeah striking out a pitcher um a, a pitcher that's batting it's just it's not going to be the same as striking out mike trout you know gotcha yeah that's really cool so i, I mean I, the way we kind of do this i guess is you know not only do we have an understanding of how much these factors uh account for or how much of these factors are predictive when trying to project a, a certain outcome of happening on a, on an at-bat, but also when the actual outcome takes place, we can kind of pull out the context and actually understand what, what we've truly learned about this. Uh, yeah, exactly. Interesting. Cool. Um, a, a couple other things I know that have changed this year. I, 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 just interesting to see if there's, um, I don't know, anything on the, the, uh, simulation side that that's interesting about these but um the the seven inning double headers are are gone here this year um if i if i if, if i remember correctly beyond making our life super easy or much easier for the um the back end team here is there any kind of impact to i guess what we can take is there a discrepancy from what we can learn from those seven inning games from last year and then also the way that it's going to ch- change this year I feel like that was a terrible Um, question. Does that make sense what I'm trying to ask? I I get what you're saying. Uh, Because our projections are like on a play by play, like they're created based on each play rather than each game. We're not going to like, it's not going to be anything that we have to like do extra work to account for. So like if we're not looking at like the average run scored by each team or whatever um, in each game. And so we're only looking at play by play. So it's like, because just because the game ended at seven innings, it doesn't really impact how the projections work. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously from a DFS standpoint, it impacts how much you want to play those double header games. Um, but yeah, it's not really ha- like we're kind of naturally similar to the DH stuff. Like we're naturally just accounting for that in the way that our projections and, and SIM work. Um, I do want to, point out for those that don't know they while they did get rid of i think the seven inning double headers they are keeping the, like the automatic runner starting on second in extra innings gotcha um I, I think correct me if i'm wrong uh anybody that's listening but i'm pretty sure they are keeping that that is already in the sim and that's just something like it's a minor thing but it's in any impact that it has it's gonna be accounted for in the sim because we are doing that i think basically it just means like there's fewer um like super long games um that the extra inning games will end more quickly because someone's more likely to score um and so it leads to like slightly higher scoring because obviously uh you know you just you have an extra runner if it's tied but i don't think it has a big impact on like dfs gotcha yeah, I mean, overall, I, the the impression I'm kind of getting is that the way we do this makes our model somewhat resilient just because mm-hmm. like, it, what would apparently be a pretty big change to the way a baseball game would look if you were watching it, uh, we actually can just kind of account for it very naturally by just inputting the new rules changes in and, and letting the, the sims kind of work. Yep. Cool. Sure. Um, 
what is what's next for us here? I know I imagine there's still work ongoing with some of the things that we've planned on implementing for this season, but uh, especially as we've gone along to get ready for this season, is there anything that uh, we're already kind of maybe looking at for next season or maybe as the season goes on, something that maybe a future improvement that we want to do? One thing that we haven't talked about that's not strictly related to the model, uh, but is our ownership projections are mm-hmm. going to get a big overhaul for this season. So um, just you know, from a DFS perspective, we are putting a lot of work into improving our ownership. Uh, so that'll be, I think it'll be noticeably better. Um, if not from day one, certainly, like I think that's, that's something that we're kind of working on over the next few weeks. And so we'll, we'll see a big improvement with that. Um, outside of that, I would say, and Will can chime in, uh, with anything else that he's thinking about, but the, the main thing that is one of my priorities is just sort of really building out, um, a a really strong, like back testing framework. Um, Mm -hmm. we have a lot of analysis in place right now that we're looking at, but one of my big priorities for our team is, um, making it a lot easier to test changes and to compare our projections to Vegas to other projection sources and really just like make sure that we're always improving and that we're we're staying like um, as high quality this year as we have been in the past so you know it, it's it's really like will um, and Eric the other uh, guy in our models team are like just heads down like improving the the model and the ownership and all that and I'm uh, kind of trying to um, both like help them in that and create some some frameworks for making sure that we're like uh staying really um focused and like the the analytics of like how we're improving um are obvious and automated and and that'll just make it way easier as we're moving forward to like hey if we make this change we know the impact that it has as the season's progressing we know exactly how good we are and if we're if we have biases or flaws that we can like fix them right away so yeah that that's really the main thing yeah and i think for me just as far as like on, on the model itself uh stolen bases are the biggest one that are like that's what i've been working on sort of the last couple of days mm-hmm. uh, and i think that they'll almost certainly be implemented tonight or tomorrow um so definitely ready for opening day so you know getting those in there i think will be uh obviously like relatively minor as far as like the actual like mean projection but for context in the game that's can be really important you know is the game if if a runner is you know more likely to steal in the ninth inning on first to get a runner into scoring position you know like there there is going to be some context benefits to that um and then i also have a couple of ideas that i want to work on this season with regards to like more pitcher rotation stuff Mm -hmm. um and borrowing sort of a lot of ideas from our nba rotations and in like a very similar manner of looking at sort of context looking at historical things made by that team um and so i think that there's definitely some some more things for me to dig into gotcha cool i'm excited for it i uh matt without i i know maybe you haven't uh i know it's mostly been eric uh working on this super hard but can you talk a little bit about what's going in or what's changing with the ownership model um i know i've talked a bunch um on office hours about how the ownership is kind of currently set up. Um, but w- what's changing for the way that we're projecting ownership going forward? Yeah. So, I mean, to be honest right now, we're, we're kind of deep into the analysis phase. Uh-huh. Um, so we're, we've got a ton of like contest data of like real, you know, like mostly uh, DraftKings, like actual contest entries and ownership where we can kind of compare our projected to the actual, um, look at some other sources for ownership and compare us against them. Um, I think the first step is like, let's identify our biases, identify where we're, we need to um, make adjustments. So like maybe we're uh, under projecting ownership for like the stud pitchers, um, mm-hmm. guys like DeGrom and, and Scherzer and stuff, where maybe we're like too low on, on those types of uh, players or maybe like, teams with really high Vegas totals were we're not accounting for that well enough. Um, but honestly, like right now it's, we're really into the analysis phase, um, which is, that's kind of the first step. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lot of it is improving on the existing process, which you've talked about. It's like, you know, we have kind of industry, other, um, industry projections and stuff that we're kind of putting into the builder with these, uh, 
rules that we're basically trying to like mimic contest like field lineups uh as well as we can and yeah. get ownership from like the exposures of those lineups and it's sort of just improving on that process um and making that as realistic as possible because really the goal with like you get perfect ownership projections by like building perfect contest like field contest lineups um and so like that's i think what we really want to try to get best at is like right. let's make let's predict what the field is going to do and ownership will naturally come from that so yeah that's one of the things i've always liked about the way we kind of do it and i talk about that on office hours too is that it's because it comes from building lineups it can already kind of pick up on some of the nuance of where there's certain uh positional scarcity or or, or things like that so yeah i'm excited to to, to see where that goes um I think it's a good opportunity to to jump into some questions. So we have a few questions that have been uh, showing up in chat here. The first one was from Brad. Um, we've talked a lot about the the bullpen and the reliever model here, but a uh, really good question here. Um, are we capturing this season uh, an understanding of which relievers have pitched recently and how that impacts their likelihood of um, being used in, in a particular game? Yeah, so for each pitcher... Um... It, we essentially we have all of like their recent game logs and everything um mm -hmm. and their days rest as, as as well as how many pitches they threw recently so we we have an idea of the, the freshness of each arm um for gotcha. each pitcher so you know like in some of those marathon games which are probably less likely now with the runner on second but like you know we have an idea of like yeah they can put in this pitcher but he just started yesterday so he can't really throw more than you know 20 pitches before his arm's gonna give out uh, yeah, so we, we are incorporating sort of their recent appearances and pitches thrown in sort of a freshness sense. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah, that was I mean, one of the things that last year when I was playing Showdown that I would do for research is to try to see which relievers had um, pitched recently. Is that is that new? Is that something that we've recently added uh, as of this season? So I know the the pitch counts themselves, like as far as, you know, like how we're incorporating that, like it's for if this pitcher comes in, how much are they throwing on average? That has been around for a while, but I'm not sure on the logic of their replacements. Yeah, no, that's that's new. It um, feels new. I, I, yeah, I do want to just like disclaimer that that's yeah, it is new, and so it, we haven't fully. If you're playing showdowns to start the season, I would just, um, I mean, obviously, like opening day, it's not as much of an issue, but like mm -hmm. there is still value in doing your own research um, as we really like. Um, get better at this because uh you know it is a tough thing to know exactly like well if someone throws 15 pitches the day before how's that going to impact their um whether they'll pitch the next day um and teams can like switch around their rosters pretty frequently and we do try to you know we have data sources to get like updated rosters but you just always want to be careful with playing really pitchers and showdowns and like um, i think there's always value in just like doing a bit of your own research mm -hmm. uh to confirm that okay this pitcher is actually you know they haven't been sent to the minors like this morning you know they're look at their recent usage i think there's still value but like we'll be kind of improving on that as the season gets started gotcha cool um we had a question here uh that this came in in slack um said is the mlb sim granularity by the app bat by the at the by batter level or the by pitch level um, I think we've kind of established here that we are doing at pitch um, or excuse me <laughs> by batter uh, said the exact opposite thing. It is an at bat um, and correct me if I'm wrong there, but is there any value to doing a by pitch by pitch sim here? How is that something we've talked about? Any, any value that would be added there? I think it, my personal opinion on it is that by going pitch by pitch, we're introducing a lot more risks uh, to it for not, like, I, I don't see the ceiling of accuracy being significantly higher at a by pitch level versus by at bat. Gotcha. And I think you're exposing yourself to a lot of risks of, like, you know, pitch selection and pitch, like, tar like where are they pitching and, you know, yeah. how well they're working the zone. And I think it, it makes more sense to, to take it at an at bat level mm -hmm. uh, where you get sort of the, the smooth uh, data yeah. sets of that. Yeah. If you do on a pitch by pitch, like, one tiny, like, um, flawed assumption it's going to just have a huge impact on the end result um and the other thing is like points are awarded on an at bat level not a pitch level right. and so like that's kind of a good rule of thumb is like go as granular as like the 
DFS point scoring is. Um, I mean, obviously that's not a perfect uh, rule of thumb, but like, I don't think there's really a need to go on the pitch by pitch level. That said, I think that is something that we want to look at in the future is to not necessarily do a pitch by pitch sim, but look more closely at pitch selection, see how much signal there is in terms of certain pitch types versus certain batter types, mm-hmm. stuff like that. Um, I think there's there's some cool applications of that kind of thing, but you know, right now it's not too much on that level. Gotcha. Cool. Um, another question we had here um, in Slack is stat cast data considered? Uh, not really. Uh, so we do, we look at, um, in our data, we do have, uh, like exit velocity, um, and, and like launch angle kind of stored in the data. Uh, we've looked at it a bit. Um, and to be honest, we haven't found too much statistical significance in, mm-hmm. in looking at that data. Um, I think that there, that's again, there's, there's some opportunity there. Um, but it's one of those things where like, you have to be really careful with that, how you're considering StatCast data, because it is this really granular data that's easy to misinterpret. And I think it's very easy for people to look at StatCast data and get kind of either too much noise or just like false um, things that are like double counted. Like if you're already looking at kind of the play-by-play data, it's really, you, you have the danger of double counting certain aspects of StatCast. You have the danger of um, not accounting for sample sizes, uh, for just having these false assumptions. So um, we have looked at StatCast data. It's not really incorporated into the model um, because we haven't found like statistically significant use for it. But it's like one of the things that I think we all kind of, we would like to find better ways to incorporate that. Um, but I think there's there's enough edge and value that you're getting from like the normal play-by-play that uh, it's not really needed. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think it's like at its best, it's a good leading indicator. Uh, you know, like if a pitcher's velocity or something like that is is changing. Uh, but I think that honestly, the with the way that we're handling sort of like recent game sample sizes and adjusting and everything like that, that we're catching up to that fairly quickly without the risk of misinterpreting like what could be noise. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like, you know, at its best pure signal, it's really a leading indicator that might be a little bit faster uh but there is a lot of like risks in how to handle it Mm -hmm. gotcha makes sense um question from from chase here that i think is a little bit more practical uh like of what you'd be doing building lineups in the app Uh, but he said does the sim variance or or, uh, any lineup building features become less effective when uploading your own projections instead of using the default ones and even as a more general way of kind of just thinking about this question um, if people are making adjustments to projections for some of the reasons we've talked about here uh, maybe minor league or 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 bullpen rotations or anything like that uh, is there any concern that they're lowering the value of the sims or or uh, i mean i've even people have asked me on stream before am i ruining the sims uh, by coming in here and making changes you're not ruining the sims i'll yeah. start out with that um i, I mean I, I won't like uh i won't sugarcoat it. like I, I do think that you when you change projections and with sim var- it makes sim variance less like accurate i i would say just in terms of or like less reflective of the real sim outcomes right because at sim variance 10 for example each lineup is using actual scores from the sims if you're adjusting projections then they're no longer using actual scores of the Sims. It's using the actual scores of the Sims, but then like plus or minus your kind of difference in projections. Um, but like, there's so much value to like uh, the standard deviations and like the ranges of outcomes that come from Sim variants. And you're still getting that when you adjust them. It's just, you're kind of adjusting, you're like shifting over those distributions to match your new means. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, maybe you're losing a little bit of the value of the Sims, but if you feel like you're gaining enough value from having better projections, you know, by by kind of adjusting a player that you feel is like being under their mean is too low in, in Saber Sims projection for whatever reason, um, if you feel like there's kind of enough value there, and, that, and it's, obviously it's hard to know like how to quantify that, but it's not like you're just ruining the Sims. You're getting a ton of value out of them. It's just you're not necessarily getting like the real 
like sim results in your lineups like when we talk about like that zero zero ten build um where like each lineup is an optimal individual sim you know you're you're not getting that specifically but you're still getting like you know 90 percent of the value of like sim variants or that's just a made up number but mm -hmm. i don't know if, if will you agree or disagree with that but like that's how i would describe it it's like yeah you're losing a little bit of value but like just a small amount of it yeah i so i think in in something like baseball it's more impactful whereas like in nba if you're bumping a player a point like because there's one the points they score are relatively higher like it's you know adding a point mm -hmm. to a three-point player is significantly different than yeah. somebody going for 50. um in baseball i think i'd almost prefer to do it at the exposures level so it's like if i know that yeah. i wanted to bump this team like i think saber sim is low on the cubs i would rather just go bump their exposures in the post build setting um rather than try and mess with the projections themselves yeah that's, that's a really good point yeah. yeah because of the way that the points come you know it someone with a projection of 10 it's going to be like a combination of home runs which are worth like 14 to 20 points and walks that are worth two points and if you're like bumping at that player up by two points it's going to like add two to all of their results but maybe like you actually think that there's going to get more home runs but the same amount of walks and so it's and it's hard for us to like really account for that in how we're doing those adjustments so i think will's right that like and this is how i build lineups as well is like i much prefer to do that at the exposure level where it's like build your lineups with sabers and projections and then be like all right i want to just like take more of like the sims where the cubs do well and not necessarily adjust those sims but just like pull more of them into my lineups yeah interesting and i i think maybe this is a, a little bit of a rabbit hole but now i'm interested uh, what do you think about the difference between adjusting projections versus exposures on step three? Like, is there, is the, is the potential risks of adjusting projections on step one still the same when you're doing that on step three after the lineups have been built or are those two kind of roughly equivalent at that point? Um, so, I mean, it's definitely, it's much different to adjust projections on step three than on step one. Yeah. Because on, if you do it on step one, then it's changing how lineups are built. Um, on step three, it's changing how lineups are sorted. Yeah. Uh, the nice thing about in step three, the nice thing about adjusting projections is that you can kind of have a nice, a better distribution of how your line, if you're like entering a bunch of different contests, mm -hmm. um, like say you have a 150 max and a 20 max. Um, if you adjust projections, then it's like you might bring more, like say in the Cubs example, you might bring more of those Cubs stacks uh up to like the top of your rankings if you kind of bump all of the cups better projections up um but you're not just like bringing the top 20 to the top yeah. of your list or or only bring like if you set a max exposure cap you know then you might just like the last 20 lineups are don't have this player and so if you enter them with like a unique rank fill method then you're going to get none of them in your 20 max and it's going to be this weird distribution so I think that the benefit of doing the projection level um, in step three is just having a nicer distribution. And it's like, if you don't know how much exposure you want, you just know like, hey, I want to like sort these this team a bit higher. I want to like increase the projection of this pitcher a bit and let's just see how that shakes out. Uh, I I will personally do that, um, especially I think in well, really all sports, you know, it's just a nice way to like, just see like, hey, what happens if I bump this players up? this projection up by three points, like how is that going to impact how much they get into my lineups? Gotcha. Cool. Well, I think this is a, a good opportunity um, to kind of start closing things out. I don't see any other questions coming in here. Um, on the subject of the more practical side of things, I will be releasing a few videos next week uh, as a bit of a strategy guide, a tutorial uh, of how to use SaberSim, how to put everything we've been talking about this week together and build winning MLB DFS lineups. Uh, this video or this stream uh, uh, as it is live right now um, is second in our series of our baseball content that we're putting out for this season. So if you missed it, Matt and I talked a little bit more about just higher level baseball DFS strategy yesterday on stream, uh, had a really great conversation. Definitely recommend going back and watching that, particularly if this is uh, one of your first couple seasons of baseball DFS or just want a general refresher on the overall strategies. But 
uh, in summary, I hope this was a helpful video for you all understanding what we're doing when we say that we're simulating games, why it's so valuable for DFS, and kind of a deep dive into what's actually going on play by play in the simulations. Uh, you don't have to take any of our word for it. We have a free seven day trial on our site, sabersim.com. You can come check us out. We are now less than a week away. So you sign up today, uh, you'd actually get access for that opening day. Uh, but free seven days, no strings attached. So come check us out. Uh, thanks, Matt and Will, for coming on and, and breaking it down for me and looking forward to the start of the season. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. Thanks, guys.